boss, I really want to understand what reality is all about. And trained as a scientist, I come to believe that science is the most reliable descriptor of reality. But I want to come to you as a philosopher of science to help me understand the scope of science and also its limits. Well, you know, uh, I try to be an empiricist. I'm in the empiricist tradition, so I have a, an empiricist line on that. And uh, when I think about science, I think of it as a large human enterprise that has certain criteria of success, has an aim that is uh, explained through its criteria of success. And as an empiricist, I say they all have to do with what's observable, that a science is indeed going to give us the best possible explanation and description of what we can find in the observable realm. Um, that is what it is for science to be successful. And, um, you know, an empiricist is not the only philosopher in the world. <laughs> There's definitely going to be disagreement with that. Um, but that's what I would like to start. Because you've called yourself, in the empiric tradition, an anti-realist. Yes. You do not believe in so-called scientific realism. That's right. Now, what does that mean? Well, you see, the scientific realist also has a line on how to understand science. And they will also say science is an enterprise that has a certain aim, criteria of success. But they, they claim that the criterion of success is truth, period. Truth in every respect. So not just about what's observable, but also about all the things that they postulate in order to explain the observable things. And um, so, so they have less distance between their explanation and some ultimate reality. You have sort yes. of a, 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 a filter there. Is, is that yeah. fair? Well, it's very philosophical to say ultimate reality. <laughs> okay, right? all right. I mean, the working scientist, I don't think, speaks in those terms, right? Yeah. Um, but um, when it comes to the kinds of things that in science are postulated to explain the observable things that we all experience mm -hmm. and deal with, right? The scientific realist says, if you accept the theory, you believe that those things are real. And I say, if you accept the theory, you believe that it's empirically adequate. That means that it is adequate with respect to the observable phenomena, what we can find in measurement and observation, how we can test the theories. That is the criterion of success. So uh, you've called yourself, again, a, a constructive empiricist. Yes. What, what does that mean, the constructive part? Uh, well, that has to do with how I see the methods of the sciences. I see the scientist not as uh, discovering, like Columbus discovered America, but constructing models and theories in order to represent the observable phenomena. And it's a constructive enterprise. They construct the models that they hope will fit what we can test. Okay, and the, uh, the, the difference though, the core difference between this so-called anti-realism mm -hmm. and the, the, the realism is that the, the scientist who has their, their theory, their model, their law, whatever they want mm -hmm. to call it, mm -hmm. believes that is the truth of that matter, whereas you're claiming that it, it, it is merely a, maybe a replicable observation. I claim that that's the criterion, exactly. So, you know, the scientific realist, like Hilary Putnam at one point, I mean, she doesn't, he has changed his mind at various <laughs> points, um, uh, Richard uh, Boyd and so on, they say that if a theory is mature and mm -hmm. it's acceptable, then they want to give an explanation of that. And they say the explanation is that it must be that the terms in the theory, even the very theoretical terms, they refer to real things and that the statements that are made about these things, which are perhaps not observable, are true. That's the explanation for them of the success of science. Hmm. Okay. But, but you now, believe that's inaccessible? Well, they also say it's inaccessible. Oh. Uh, I mean, it's not observable, yeah. right? Okay, right? Or they'll say it's indirectly accessible through our observations, right? right? Um, but look, what they are doing is they are giving an explanation of the success of science, but it's not a scientific explanation. It's a metaphysical explanation. Mm -hmm. okay? If a scientist wants to explain the success of a scientific theory, he'll do it using science. So if they want to explain why 19th century electrodynamics was successful, they'll do that starting with the science they have now. Mm -hmm. And that's a scientific explanation 
of the success of people like Maxwell, um, Fresnel, and so on. Mm -hmm. Okay. The scientific realist says, no, we have an explanation of the success of science in terms of reference and truth. It's mm. not a scientific explanation, it's a metaphysical explanation. You see, they step outside of science. And for an empiricist, that's uh -huh. not the thing to do. Would they characterize themselves that way? That's how you're characterizing them. I am characterizing them that way, but, uh, well, <laughs> there are different scientific realists, <laughs> but many of them are very happy with metaphysics. Mm -hmm. They say, yes, metaphysics is an extension of science. We do that. Well, they would say perhaps that you have to step outside outside science to see what science is doing. And if you're only in mm. science, you're, you're caught in some self-referential uh, circle. Mm, mm. Well, that there's a stepping back, of course, in any philosophy. Mm -hmm. I mean, in philosophy of, philosophy of law, philosophy of religion, philosophy of mathematics, philosophy of science, we step back and look at it, mm -hmm. absolutely. But um, to start giving explanations that refer to things beyond what's observable, you know, that's more than just stepping back. That's buying into a whole other story, you see? Mm. And an empiricist does not buy into other stories about reality. You've also used the uh, very interesting phrase that where science starts. Mm -hmm. You say science starts from, use two terms, provisional realism yes. and presumptive materialism. Yes. So let, let's discuss each one. I think we've been discussing the provincial mm. realism. Mm -hmm. Th that's yeah. their metaphor, their mm -hmm. starting point. Yes. And then the presumptive materialism. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I would say that, um, you know, the scientist, his presumptions are that what he's investigating, he will find within the domain that he has mapped out. So uh, when he's developing a theory, he has a domain of application in mind. Mm -hmm. And he's asking questions, and he expects to find the answers inside that domain. And if he is um, a natural scientist, then he's dealing with the material world. That is the domain of application for him. He is only looking for answers that he can find in that domain. Mm -hmm. That is his approach. That is a scientific method for his domain. And um, th it doesn't follow from this that when we try to interpret science, when we try to understand science, that we have to have the same presumption. Uh, I would have a sense of being nervous if, if a scientist had a different presumption yeah. because then oh, he's yes. bringing into it all sorts of baggage and oh, presuppositions yeah. and who knows what and may distort yeah. his, uh, his analysis. No, I absolutely agree oh. and uh, I think that it was a great advance for science to liberate itself from medieval metaphysics and from 17th century metaphysics and from theology. That was liberation for the sciences, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Um, I think that many philosophers today still think about science in what are essentially 17th century terms, sometimes even medieval terms, <laughs> see? Um, and that empiricism was the tradition that moves out of that. So as you look upon science now uh, mm. from a 21st century perspective, mm. uh, how then do you summarize this sense of their starting point of uh, uh, provisional realism and presumptive materialism? Well, you know, you have to think about what is the structure of a good scientific inquiry. Um, the way to think of it is probably to think of a project that a scientist designs, submits, wants support for, submits perhaps to the National Science Foundation for peer review, <laughs> okay? and. That must be a well-designed project. And that means that, first of all, the concepts within which he approaches the subject have to be well-defined. The questions that he's going to ask are going to be well-defined. And a well-defined question is one where the range of answers, possible answers, is known. Mm -hmm. They're not predicting what they will find, right, right. but the possible answers are known and what the answers mean. All of that has to be clear in the design of the project. Now, that, I think, is what characterizes a scientific inquiry. Of course, it can go wrong in the sense that they might not find something worthwhile. 
if it goes wrong very badly, you're going to have a scientific revolution, <laughs> okay? And it starts again, but again in the same format, you see? So that is what I mean by the provisional realism and the presumptive materialism, which we should generalize to just any domain of any science, I think, mm -hmm. that in order to have a well-designed project, you have to have, first of all, well-defined well concepts, secondly, well-defined questions, and that means that you know the range of possible answers that you could possibly get and what they mean. And not all inquiry is like that. And that would give you good science, but, yes. but that would not necessarily exhaust all truth. Absolutely, right. That is how I see it, yes. Yeah, I think that science, you know, for us, the empirical sciences, they're a paradigm of rational inquiry. Absolutely. And I'm going to, I'm, if you let me, I'm going to say many more admiring things about science. <laughs> okay? But I do want to emphasize it's a paradigm. Mm 